thanking Jan for the invitation and uh, tell you how happy I am to see so many familiar faces here and some new faces as well. And uh, I was thinking of what exactly should, should I present. So the title is uh, Algebraic Groups and Ergodic Theory. And I didn't know what exactly is the audience I'm preparing my lecture to and what would be the, the, the level and the knowledge that uh, uh, you come with. Uh, so I decided at least the first lecture to, to give a very soft introduction of some toy case in which one can see somehow all the ingredients uh, that will come about in the next lectures, but in a very concrete way, uh, but still, uh, okay, that's, Still, that, that the ideas will be uh, uh, will show. Uh, maybe before this, let me tell you that we deal with uh, uh, groups uh, of matrices. Yeah. And another main example is, well, we have the determinant map, which is a homomorphism. So we can talk about the kernel of it, and this is S as well. A group of two by two matrices of determinant one. Start by asking a question, or maybe uh, SL2R as well as GL2R acts on the plane R2 by linear transformations. Now, uh, we will focus here in, the, in this course on, on dynamics. So, somehow, the first invariance of an action uh, is the orbit structure of the action. Of course, zero is a fixed point, and the action is transitive on the rest. Whenever we have a transitive action, I can identify it with this is G for now on for this lecture. So this is G modulo the stabilizer of point. U will be, say, the stabilizer in G of 1, 0. So this is specifically all matrices that take 1, 0 to 1, 0 and leave everything else here unchanged. But of course, for determinant reason, I need to have 1 here. Uh, X here. X here. Oh, and this is is to check this is isomorphic to the additive ring group. So this, this is called a unipotent. Every group which is conjugated, this one is called unipotent as well. Unipotent, uni because the eigenvalues are all uh, now here is the first problem. This one is very easy. I will discuss later on a slightly more, uh, slightly, or actually considerably hard problem. But it is just uh, as a starter, find all maps from R two to R two that commute with, with, with G, with G. This means um, for every G in G, X in R2, So 
first observation. Well, zero goes to. Please. Because it's a fixed point. And the fact that zero is a fixed point of G uh, must be uh, uh, preserved. So the image of zero should be a fixed point as well. By implementation, and this is the only one. Now, well, this one works. So if you feel this is of a too low level and you want to rush me up, please do. Uh, in a minute, I will discuss most of these problems. Actually, uh, I will tell you right away. I will change this with SL two Z, and some algorithmic uh, theory will appear. But just to get started, I, I want to uh, to start with this. One. Please tell me if this is inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, maybe to answer this properly, let me now discuss. The orbit structure of U on R. What is that one? This is something I want to put on the board anyway. So uh, let's store our two here. Zero is fixed, right? What about one zero? Well, one zero is fixed as well. We use a stabilizer of one zero. And, of course, we commute with the scalar multiplication. Alpha zero, which is alpha times one zero, is fixed as well for every real alpha. So all this uh, x-axis is fixed. So this is why I put point here. Uh, what about, uh, I don't know, zero one? If I apply, I don't know, the matrix, one, 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 oh, x, y, if I apply this one, I guess I should have put here, this one, never mind. Uh, so this will go to uh, x plus p, y, y. So the, the height, y, is uh, remain the same, and we add, uh, this is the orbit of one zero. So it's just the real line going in speed one from left to right. And the orbit of two zero is similar, only it goes twice as fast. At least we don't see in the picture. And what I'm illustrating here is the orbit structure of U on R2. Now, one zero should go by phi to something which is u-fixed as well. So it must go to alpha zero. Uh, so every other x, well, we said that there exists g in g such that x is g one zero. So P of X should be P of G one zero should be G of P of one zero should be G of alpha zero, but G is a matrix, it commutes this kind of multiplication. There you go. Is it antique here? Map 
is a scalar multiplication. Write some alpha in R. Well, if alpha is zero, we push everything to zero. Otherwise, zero is fixed, and basically the phi is fixed is zero, but outside it will be an automorphism of the space R2 minus zero, or the space G mod U. So here's a general remark. I will give us an exercise. Uh, if you take G mod, let me uh, try to use generic uh, level scale, G mod H. Think of this as a G space and ask what is the automorphism of this set? So self maps which commute with G. I will not write down the explanation of this notation. I think this is clear to a point. But I will repeat. G act on this open space on the left. And I'm asking of self maps that commute with that G action. So maybe I'll ask first, what if G was trivial? This is kind of more familiar. G act on the left, the left regular action of G on itself. What kind of self maps of G do commute with that one? Right multiplication. Uh, in general, if H is a non trivial subgroup, I cannot multiply that cross space, and it, it, it is not meaningful to multiply on the right unless I'm using something which normalizes H. So if N uh, is the normalizer in G of H, and if N is an element here, I can send GH to GNH, and this is a meaningful action of N. It is meaningful, well defined, but it is not faithful. Obviously, there is a kernel to this action. There is a normal sum of N, which act trivially, and this is A itself. So my claim is that this map here defines an isomorphism between these two groups. Now, in this specific example of ours, the normalizer of U is, is what we call uh, P, is, is the group of all terminate one triangular matrices, which is called the, the parabolic subgroup or the Borel subgroup. The other division denoted by P. And, and this is isomorphic, of course, to R, this is, which R is U, semi-dial product with R star, which is that one. And P mod U is, is just its R star. This is the R star of non-zero alpha. Here I consider only non-zero uh, alphas. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay, so this solves our uh, naive question uh, completely. But now, as I told you, I want to actually consider a, a much harder problem. Maybe I'll just use this. Two 
way to matrices. Two by two integer value. Matrices of determinant one. Maybe I, I, I won't make it enough. So we may consider uh, groups as GL2G, and this is sometimes confusing. This, this, this is not this is not part of the class, but uh, I just want to make the following remark. This is not the group of real valid matrices which are invertible, and the entries of them are over Z, are integers. This is the group of uh, integer valued matrices, which are invertible over Z. So I want the inverse to be uh, with integers coefficients as well. Okay? Matrices over matrices with uh, inverses over zero. to the invertible in Z, which is just plus minus one. So this, are, this is the group of integer valid matrices with the terminal which is plus or minus one, and SL to Z is the kernel of this homomorphism, and this is index two. Unlike so to R in GL to R, which is of index R star. This is index Z star. And it's just confusing, so I make this remark. Uh, so actually, in my discussion, there is no much difference between SL to Z and GL to Z. So I prefer to, to think of SL. Uh, so did anyone think about this problem? Problem two over there? So the answer is that uh, this is not a good question. Um, just as stated, all maps, this is crazy, with no conditions, because think about the SL2Z uh, orbit structure of R2, it is wild. Unlike, and this is, let me emphasize this right here, unlike this example of tame dynamics, this will come over and over again in my course. This is, this is the illustration, this is you act on R2. This is an illustration of an algebraic group acting on an algebraic varieties. And the, the orbits are sub-varieties. The orbits are nice. In this case, all, every orbit is closed. In general, this is not the case. Not every orbit needs to be closed, but every, every orbit is quite close to that. It will be open in its closure. Whenever an algebraic group acting on acts on a variety. While the action of SL2Z on R2 is wild. You have plenty of orbits, all are countable, of course, and almost everyone is, uh, is essentially free. So stabilizers are typically trivial. You can use Bell category to, to see this or something. I mean, it's quite easy to see it. A typical orbit would be just a copy of Gamma. And if you just take an orbit, I can restrict it to this orbit and can define phi to be a right multiplication by an element of gamma, right? But this element of gamma could be changed from orbit to orbit. Moreover, I can permute the orbits. So I can really go by it. So if I want to, uh, to ask a meaningful, a meaningful question, I must restrict myself. So here is the, the actual problem I want to state. Uh, find all, okay, I could write continuous here, but this would be maybe too easy. 
measurable Borel mass from R2 to R2 commuting with that gamma as it to Z. And again, I can go quite well here uh, because I can change things from one orbit to one orbit, but so let me restrict myself, myself up to nonsense. Define that point. So I want an essential solution. Every such map is essentially so on, on a full metal set, and this is with respect to the Lebesgue measure. question I want to solve uh, during this hour. <clears throat> and again, uh, I'm interested in the ideas that will uh, come about doing so. Just a general question. What is so special? What is the feature of gamma uh, that I will be used? I will be using. And the only thing I will use is the fact that it is a lattice. in G is this clear, this is clear. As C is this clear in R. And this is slightly less clear. And uh, the space, G on gamma, has, well, it has a G action on it. And it has a G invariant. Probability measurement. Okay, should not. Whenever you see a cosset space, if G is a locally conform group, H is a closed subgroup, G mod H has a canonical measure class on it. I will discuss this uh, in details in the future, but I think uh, you kind of know those things. And uh, if gamma is discrete, in this case, uh, we have an invariant measure on G mod gamma, and the, the special property of SO two Z is that uh, uh, well, Z in R is co-compact. R mod Z is a circle, is a compact space. SO two Z is not co-compact in SO two R, but it's pretty close to it. it uh, the measure on it is is finite, so up to some normalization, it is a probability measure. And um, so these, these two properties are the defining properties of uh, a lattice, and I will explain how this help us uh, solving this problem. So the, the problem here, I, I could replace it with this lattice. But I want, again, to be uh, concrete, as, as concrete as I can. Um, so uh, I already... Uh, show you this picture of the dynamics of the unipotent flow. The next thing I want to uh, 
to do, maybe before uh, solving this question, uh, is to, to discuss for a minute the dynamics, the different dynamics of A. So let's introduce the notation which I will uh, keep pretty much throughout uh, this course. Uh, let A be all this diagonal. Let me now uh, discuss the A orbits on R2. So as before, zero is being fixed. What will be the zero the orbit of one zero? Well, it will be all this R star. What will be the orbit of zero one? It will be this. What will be the orbit of 1, 1? It will be this two sheet. Uh, Akarula, etc., etc., etc. So this is the orbit structure. Again, maybe I, I want to uh, emphasize this. The orbits are very, very nice. The, by themselves, they are the right varieties. Look at this orbit is closed, this orbit is closed, this orbit over here is not closed, the closure contains this point as well, but it is an open subset of its closure, right? So this is again tail dynamic. Orbits are locally closed. I will discuss this. Term, uh, while maybe one and a half of by dynamics, which again I would pretty much of this course will be about comforting these two things algebraic geometry and algebraic fluid. Uh, just maybe just for you to appreciate these thing dynamics, let me remind. Uh, some wild dynamics that we would see sometimes. So, irrational rotation. If you take the circle, which we think of as R mod Z, and we apply the one transformation of adding alpha, when alpha is irrational, we get the dynamics which never converges and my, my orbits will equidistant along the circle. And there, there will, will not be a nice quotient space for this. Here there will be a nice quotient space. Maybe because of this thing here, not as nice to be a house of space, but still something that I can understand. These when dynamics I just don't understand. When you speak of ten dynamics and one dynamics here, you, are speak, you, you, you mentioned already for the second time, but do you mean that this is an, as, as a kind of definition or just a So, time? no. So, well, I'm, here I'm talking about two levels. This, this talk is introductory. This is a thing that will appear, and I will study it uh, in details. Now I'm considering an example. Um, when I talk about dynamics, I don't need these uh, adjectives. I need this picture. We understand dynamics. But I, I'm noticing that this is a nice thing which I will define in the future. I'm kind of motivating uh, next talks. I, I, I want in this talk to be quite complete. So, the, so you, we can just ignore this. But somehow I, do, I want to appeal your uh, intuition. Not, not much more than that. But so just here I just remind you, maybe say things that uh, we will focus on the future on. But uh, probably you are. Everyone here is familiar with uh, this kind of example. 
So irrational rotation and uh, maybe the action of gamma on G mod U, as we discussed before, or the action of U on G mod gamma. So uh, this is kind of the same dynamic, so there is duality between these two things. Gamma and G and U are according to our uh, standing notation. Uh, I said already this is why, but I didn't explain. I will explain, I will explain this. Uh, Coming soon. Okay. Uh, but now, okay. So I have this problem. I want to discuss this, but I'm uh, stopping. And maybe I, I will discuss for a minute another question, seemingly unrelated. And this is the question of. another topic that I will touch on in the future. Invariant metrics on spaces. I want to, to write a serial method. So it's like a modern hard than that. And uh, this is not too well stated because you can define the, the discrete method on R2. It's certainly a variant under anything, but it just doesn't see the structure of R2. So let's hope we'll continue. Continuous and speculative. The standard topology. A metric is a map from space times itself to the to zero infinity, and I want it to be continuous. Okay, so this is this is very much a more stated. And let, let me now prove it, prove it by illustration. I'm about to prove is that I want to show that the distance between every two points is zero. What I will show is that the distance between every two points is less than uh, epsilon. Or every epsilon. Okay? Or maybe I'll show that it's less than two epsilon, actually. But this will be good enough, right? Uh, so let's focus on this zero one. And let's, let's take the epsilon ball around this point. I'm, I'm assuming having a metric here. No, it is not defined here. I am taking this point out. So, but that, that's the really metric. Look at the, the epsilon ball. I don't know how it looks like exactly, but I know that it contains an open set uh, around uh, one zero because I'm assuming my, my metric to be continuous. OK? Uh, and here is a point in that ball. The distance between this point and this point is less than epsilon. But now let's apply an element from the group uh, U to these two points. This point will stay fixed, but this point will be mapped to another point over here. 
the distance between these, these two points is less than epsilon as well, right? It's the same. So actually, all this line over here is contained in my ball. So my picture is not right. It should be some cylindrical in a way, right? Contains everything here. So this is the shape of my ball, so, sort of. And now take two innocent points, I know this and that, say, and ask what is the distance between these two points. Let's use this dynamics. Let's take lambda, lambda here to be one million. The image of this point will be something here. The image of this point will be something here. The distance between these two points and these two points is the same because I applied an, a group element. And I'm assuming that the metric is invariant under G, under all G, not only under U. But the distance between these two points is less than 2 epsilon because they are in the same epsilon ball. Okay, so. Is very very strong. Let's, let's, let me uh, illustrate a call. The action of oh, I need a definition for stating a corollary. Here is something, of course, I will focus on, and I will explain, and I will define in full. Uh, and this is the notion of ergodicity. But I want now to define it just in an ad hoc manner. Um, are we all happy with ergodicity? Like in some form? But let, let me write the definition on the board before stating the call down. Uh, uh, So I, I just er erase the, the problem that I want to solve. Let's not forget what it is. Uh, but now we are in some parenthesis discussion. Uh, and here's the definition. Uh, an action of G on X, X a space. Invariant metal class is a body if for every A in X measurable and invariant. either null, measure zero, or full, the complement as measure zero. Equivalent definition is equivalent. If I'm looking at an infinity of x, taking the invariance, this is just a constant. It's one dimensional. One more and this is if uh, x is an invariant measure, not only a measure class, as G of garments, I can look at L2x. So I, I will come back to this in the future. Do you see the differences? If x doesn't have an invariant measure, only measure class, or if I apply g, little g, to x, 
I changed the measure, but with some radonic protein derivative testing between the two. Uh, then I don't have an actual action of G on L2X, or maybe I should twist somehow the action. Yeah, I'm talking about the natural action of just shifting functions. So when the, the measure is invariant, for a bit, this is what we call TMD, for a weekly measure preserving action. Sorry? Probability measure is a, me yes. a, me a measure which is... Okay, so let, let me not dive into this discussion now. If, if it rings the bell, then fine. If not, we'll come back to this. Uh, but again, measurability means that we don't have invariance. Uh, sorry, yeah. a good listing. And the action of U on G mod gamma is a goal. Again, again, I should start with this observation. The action of G on G mod gamma is a goal. So the godicity is a certain generalization of transitivity. Right? If the action is transitive, of course I cannot find any G invariant subset here, which is not null or corner. Actually, I can't find any invariant subset which is not empty or everything by transitivity. So there is nothing to prove here about this one. But this requires a thought, right? But actually, it proves. And here it comes. I use. So we want to discuss, so, so here's a fact, okay, I already appeared on the board and I will come back to, but gamma inside G is a lattice. So it fits into this last line over here. So I'm proving this corollary. Uh, I want actually to look at L2, G mod gamma. This is the G space, this is also a U space. And I'm asking what are the U invariants here? I want to write, I want to show that these are the constants on the right. Or maybe start with L2. So what is it? If you have a G space, and this is the whole, this is a G space, and you have a U fixed point in it, then uh, this is the same. Finding a U fixed point is the same as finding a, a G map from G mod U to uh, that space. Is this clear? This is the orbit map of that, of that fixed point. Whenever I have a G space, I have a fixed point under U. The orbit of that point is a copy of G mod U. Well, maybe it's not a copy of G mod U. Maybe it's the stabilizer of the point is actually bigger. So the copy is an, a, 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 an image of G mod U. So is, is this isomorphism clear? And whenever I have a map from G mod U to a space, you can take the image of the base point, U. The image of that one will be a U fixed point. So I just explained this isomorphism. This natural isomorphism. Uh, 
But this is a nice metastasis. I have the hint of no. I don't know if this on the right hand side, uh, you have. What is on the right hand side? There are no. So maybe. Uh, maybe uh, uh, this is confusing because it's not general enough. If X is a G space, U in G, uh, a subgroup, then I claim that there is, in general, an isomorphism between the U fixed point in X and maps from G mod U, G covariant maps, oh, from G mod U to X. I am using this very general fact. When X is this Hilbert space, L2. So, uh, well, a seemingly complicated fact. Not so much, actually. Uh, but now, this Hilbert space is a metric space. It has the Euclidean norm, and the Hilbertian norm on it. And whenever I embed G mod U in it, I can, I can actually pull back the metric. If this was an embedding, I would get, I can pull back a metric on G mod U if maybe uh, there is a, a kernel, or this is not injective anymore. What I will get is a But this same metric must be trivial. And this means that the image of this space actually, the distance between e every two points here, when considering, considering their images here, is zero. They are the same. This map here, every such map, is constant. And the constant map, G covariant, constant map from G mod U to that space, whatever it is, must be a G fixed point. This is by what call it. This is by this theorem of proof. And this is these are only the constant by this observation. Okay. There is one slightly delicate point here, which I kind of, uh, I mean, there is this delicate point, that gamma is an axis, which I didn't prove. Many of you do know that, but I didn't prove it yet, uh, to my satisfaction. Uh, so this is slightly delicate. Uh, and there is something else, which actually I was using this, and using the fact that they have an uh, invariant probability measure on that space, uh, and I wrote, I was kind of hesitating, I wrote L infinity here to begin with. I actually needed that too. Yeah. Why did I need it too? Because I want the action of G on this space to be continuous. The action of G on L infinity functions is not continuous. It's weak star continuous, but it's not norm continuous. Well, it doesn't really matter here if you're, if you're not used to those things. But this is a small thing which uh, we should notice. Uh, okay. We are happy. So, uh, the fact that this is a lattice and there is an invariant probability measure allowed me to <laughs> consider the space L2 rather than L infinity. Okay. And this is crucial. I mean, it's, I, I could hide thing in my proof here and maybe uh, not everyone will notice, would mm -hmm. notice, but this is really crucial. Okay. And this is where I'm using the fact that gamma is a lattice. So this argument will not work for other groups. Okay. So this is here. Use that. By one hour, I will maybe it's less than an hour, an hour now, but uh, still, I thought that in one hour I'll be done with the problem that I posed finding all maps from R2 to R2 which commute with SL2Z. I, I haven't yet, but we are quite close to that. But 
maybe now we take a time to get a break.